Thank you, Jesus. All right, so look, um, before we get started real good, uh, let me just say a couple of things. There was a couple of things I wanted to say. You sent that to me? Yeah? Okay, thank you, Jesus. I just had a point that I wanted to make here. I wanted to make a point because, you know, we've been praying for a long time and that the Lord would uh, move in the midst of our services. You know, I, he's always, I personally feel like he's always been moving. You know, he moves through the word. He moves in various ways, but, you know, We've really wanted to see the gifts and the operation of the Holy Spirit moving in our church. And the way that we've been, or at least the way that I've been praying, is that, um, all right, is that um, the way that I've been praying is that, that the gifts would manifest, amen, and that, and that people would be set free and, and, and that, that the word of God would come forth in truth and anointing, amen, and that it would penetrate our hearts and that it would bring healing to our lives. And so anyway, as we were praying, you know, one major blessing has been Brother Kirk and Sister Brenda. I just can't thank them enough because, you know, God equipped them with certain gifts and they were, and they've been flowing in these gifts. I didn't even know they were kind of like a secret gym in the community. They'd show up and then I find out they start coming to church over here and all y'all tell me, man, I haven't seen that dude at the dollar store a year ago and he, he spoke a word over my life. Anyway, I wanted to, and so since we've been seeing, you know, a lot of stuff happening in the spiritual realm, so praise God for that. But look, I got this one little, I wanted to say something real quick. It's not just brother, brother Kirk and sister Brenda, because really and truly a lot of what he's praying was that the Lord would begin to impart uh, gifts. And I just wanted to say something. I'm not trying to make people feel weird, but I'm going to do it anyway, because that's what I do. I make people feel weird. But uh, I just wanted to say that, like, right Right here on this little, um, you see this shirt right here? I don't know. How long ago you think that was, Brendan? Whenever Brother Kurt gave you the word. October 20th. God, uh, Brother Kurt gave Brendan a word, and it was Joshua. Did he, did, what did he say? He just said something about Joshua. And, and that's all Brendan really remembered. But when he got home, I think he had an external shirt on, and he pulled the shirt off, and it said Joshua 1-9 is what he saw. And then, and then he saw the back of the shirt, right? Same shirt? Yeah, there's the back of the shirt. That's the front of the shirt? Okay, cool. Joshua 1-9, there it is, boom. All right, so, so he said something about Joshua, and then Brendan took the outer shirt he had on, and he realized that this was the shirt, when he, and he's like, oh my gosh, man, the same. It's like, I didn't even know I had this shirt on, and Brother Kurt didn't know he had the shirt on because he had a shirt on on the outside, you understand? That may not seem like that big of a deal to you, Josh, but now Brendan's been going through some things, and I'm not gonna get into all that because I really feel like we're gonna have a testimony coming soon. That's what I'm believing. We're gonna have a testimony, and we're gonna let him knit that together for you. Real, real nice when it's time for that. But then this is what's so encouraging to me. Edwina went to him and said, the Lord encouraged me to tell you. And what did, what did she tell you? We'll let you say it because she, she rather whispered in your ear. What, 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 did, what did you tell him? And what did you being strong and courageous. So she tells Brennan that and she don't know nothing Brennan's going through. And this is something that's been on Brennan's mind to the point where he took a screenshot or he kept a picture in his phone to remind him what the Lord had previously told him. Dude, you do what you want with that. But that's what you call a word of knowledge to confirm in a time of need for a brother. That's how the gifts are supposed to flow. Amen. That whenever it's a right now word, because, he's, because the thing that he's going to face is tomorrow. Okay, and I'll let, I'm going to be believing that, that he's going to have a, something to report to us after the fact. All right, so praise God. I just wanted to kind of share that, amen, the, the gifts and operation of the Holy Spirit. And so I guess the big thing that I, another thing I'd like to say is that I feel as though that God is probably speaking to all of us in some way, shape, or form. And, you know, Edwina could have kind of like, because I don't know, I don't know that she flows that way a lot, but it was on her heart, right? I mean, it was on her heart, and she, she felt like she needed to be obedient to the Lord. And there you go. There's an example of how, well, I don't even know that I flow in any gifts, but guess what? If the Lord's putting something on your heart, just take a chance. I mean, you're not going to hurt anybody. Like she knew she wasn't going to hurt anybody by encouraging them with scripture, but did she know it was going to bring confirmation and like a word of knowledge? No, she didn't. And that's basically what just happened. 
Amen. And really and truly, you probably could say it's a word of wisdom too, because it gives you some application, amen, on what to do. As you go tomorrow, be of good strong and be of good courage, for the Lord thy God is with thee. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I'm going to talk to you about some things tonight. And uh, listen, I'm talking to you about the tithe, about the tithe, all right? Now, whenever I say that, I want you to understand that I told y'all, it's not going to be the same kind of message you're used to hearing. So listen, it's because look, this, for me, this is fresh, fresh, hot off the press it, for me anyway, in my personal life, I have never seen this thought communicated in the word of God before. Y'all may have heard somebody else preach it. I personally have never seen this thought before. And it all started Saturday night when I was preparing for my message regarding Melchizedek. And I was about to close my iPad because it was late at night and I was about to go to sleep. And whenever I got to the part that I have preached three to four times already about Melchizedek being blessed by Abraham being blessed by Melchizedek and then Melchizedek turning around, I'm sorry, Abraham turning around and paying a tithe to Melchizedek, the Lord spoke to my heart and he began to show me something because you see the blessing that Abraham, and I'm not going to be able to quote it to you verbatim and for sake of time and, and staying focused, I want to just kind of tell you the essence of it, that whenever Melchizedek met those two kings in the valley, you remember, I just preached this to y'all Sunday. He met those two, he was in the king's valley and these two kings met him and it was two different kings. One was the king of Sodom and I told y'all, you can't make this up. His name was Bera and what did his name mean? Evil one. <laughs> okay, and he was a king over what? Sodom, which means burning. So that king, the evil one, that's king over the burning, comes out there and offers him, so he says, look, I want the souls, you keep the goods. Now, if that don't sound like the lion devil right there, then I don't know what it sounds like. And then he turned, but Melchizedek turns around, Melchizedek, name meaning king of righteousness, king over what? Salem, which is ancient Jerusalem, which means what? Peace. So king of righteousness, king of peace, priest of God most high. And he comes up to Abraham and he says, oh God of heaven and earth, possessor of all, bless Abraham. And whenever I read that word possessed, possessor, I thought to myself, and then, and then Abraham's response is he pays him a tithe. I thought to myself, Abraham is the father of the faith. Do you understand that? Listen, I, I'm going to be careful. I don't want to over talk stuff, but you need to understand that we are told Abraham was, is the father of the faith. And do you remember why? Look, the apostle Paul says in Galatians chapter three, he says, God foreseeing or foreknowing that he was going to justify the Gentiles by faith. What did he do? Preach the gospel in advance to Abraham. You got to understand before there was ever a nation called Israel, before there was ever a tribe of Levi or Judah or Issachar or Manasseh, before, there, before the children of Israel were ever in the land that God promised them, there was a man named Abraham that was living in his daddy's house and his father was a maker of idols. There was no Israel on the earth. And God called that man out, spoke to him and said, come out of your father's house because I'm going to make you a great nation. And I'm going to bless those who bless you and I'm going to curse those who curse you. And through your seed, all nations of the earth shall be blessed. Then the apostle Paul tells us in AD 65, which is at least about 2,000 years later, the apostle Paul explains to us that whenever that word was spoken, he didn't say seeds, meaning many. He wasn't talking about the nation of Israel itself. What was going to come out of Israel? What's his name? His name is Jesus. The whole world is going to be blessed through your seed. Abraham heard the voice of truth. He exited what he always knew. He left his family and he followed the voice of truth. And along the journey, he ends up in a king's valley and he hears the same voice of truth. Melchizedek, look, at the very least, I already told you, he is a type of Jesus Christ. I personally feel like he's probably more of what you call a Christophany, which means Jesus manifests in the flesh in the Old Testament. But I can't prove it absolutely to you, but I got enough evidence to make a strong case for it. Nevertheless, whatever the case, he, me 
meets up with this king and he hears that same voice of truth and that voice of truth speaks to him about the one, the God that is the possessor of heaven and earth. And when Abraham hears that voice, he pays a tithe. He paid a tithe to the spiritual authority that had approached him. And listen, what the Lord spoke to me was this, and I had to go dig it out to see if I could even prove what, because I'd never seen this before, that the tithe has to do, it shows ownership. It shows ownership and it shows whose possession you are. So I need to, I want to make this clear. I'm not asking you to even pay tithes to this church. That's between you and God. Do you understand what I'm saying? This is not about you putting money in the basket. I need to make that very, very clear. And I've already said it before, and we'll talk a little bit about more about business later instead of broadcasting it all over the place. But this is the truth. This is about you and God. And this is about me speaking what the Lord has showed me and you praying about it. Amen? And, 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 and as you pray, as long as you're, are you, okay, you don't even have to raise your hand because I'm not trying to make it weird. Everybody that wants to hear the voice of God and wants to obey. I didn't ask you if you obey every time you hear his voice. I said, everybody that wants to hear the voice of God and everybody that wants to obey the voice of God, shake your head like this. Real, if you want to do a song, okay. All right, so we're going to try to speak truth and we're going to ask the Holy Spirit to use me as a vessel of marred clay. That's what I am. I'm not, I, look, I'm part of Adam's fallen race, but I'm redeemed by the blood of the lamb. And we're going to speak the truth. Hallelujah, or what, what I'm seeing here. I ain't never seen it before. And then in the end, you're going to pray about it, and you're going to let God lead you and guide you in what you're supposed to do at that point. Amen? All right, praise God. So we're going to start this thing off, and I want to just say that God gave Israel reminders, reminders and signs of who they belong to, whose possession they were. I need you to understand that God created heaven and earth and all that in them is. This world now is populated with, last count I made was, I've heard, seven billion people. I don't know, is there more now? I don't keep track of all that. Not two things I don't keep track of is the national deficit and the, and the population of the world. Nevertheless, seven billion people, do all those people belong to God? No. Oh, he created all the people that are on the earth. He created the earth, but there's an interesting thing that God did for you and I. He gave us a free will. He gave us a free will so that we could make a choice whether or not we would be our own possession, which is ultimately by proxy being Satan's possession, or whether or not we would choose with our own free will that he gave us to choose him and that we would then be his possession. Now, whenever God called Abraham, Abraham didn't have to listen, but that's why they call him the what? Father of the faith. Because he heard the voice and he followed God and God, look, now here we are. We're in 2022, about to be 2023. And look, they got Israel. They talk about it on the, the whole world is falling into chaos. All these things are taking place. And Jesus, better, better yet than all that, where is Jesus living? inside your heart. See, nobody can take away your testimony. If you, hallelujah, if you've received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you know what I'm talking about. Because look, you might even be sitting there right now and you might be thinking, but I ain't feeling it. But you felt it before else you wouldn't be in the house of the Lord. Okay, or you know, you at least felt something. Amen? All right. So God gave Israel reminders. What was he trying to remind them? You are my possession. You belong to me. And, and, and listen, a big, big part of the story is, is that Pharaoh, foolish Pharaoh, thought that they belonged to him. Foolish Pharaoh. All right. So part of these reminders, part of these signs helped Israel understand their identity, who they belong to. Amen? You all got to understand you got an identity today. It, it, your identity is not really based on your last name that you got from your daddy. Your identity is in Christ. God's plan, he gave you, he, he produced a plan. And when you put your faith in that, the old man that was born of Adam that looked more like Daddy Jim, that's my old, my old daddy. The, guess what? That person's been born again. I got a new identity. That identity is in Christ. Look, part of these reminders, like I already said, who they were, I want you to understand they are his portion portion. God has a portion on the earth, right? And who are we? Are we God's portion? I hope we are. I believe, I, I, I can tell you this, I know, I know everybody in this place pretty good. Some of you I'm just kind of meeting, but this is something that I know. I believe everybody in this place tonight wants to be God's portion. 
Let me make a clarification, though. For at least two years now, God has made it very clear to me that just because somebody says they love me, and look, God made it clear they do love me, man. If they say they love me, they love me. But that don't mean they're serving me. God's portion serves him. You can come up with that definition, what it means in your mind, but I'm about to tell you that the word of God speaks clearly what that means. You, it's your job. It's my job to dig it out to try to tell it to you, and it's your job to go back and to search it out to make sure I'm telling you the truth. That's your job, my friend, right? Amen. All right. So, so that's that. Now look at this. Check this out. Israel. You see this happening? I don't know if you can see it, but look, Israel had reminders and signs. They had the Passover, paint the blood on the doorpost. They had the unleavened bread. Get all the yeast out of your house for a week. Yeast represents sin. They had the firstborn. We're going to talk about all these things. These are all signs and reminders. They had Levi. God took Levi to be his firstborn. They had the tithe. The tithe was paid to Levi, and Levi was a type of God's firstborn, and they had the Shemitah. We're going to talk a little bit about that a little, in a second. And they also had the circumcision. Okay, these were reminders and signs that God had a people on the earth that belonged to him. And now in the New Testament, look, baptism is kind of like circumcision in a way. It's a one-time thing that you do, and it represents our death in Christ. Communion is a type of Passover because, look, the Last Supper became the first communion the night that before Jesus was arrested. And look, we still got tithes. And, and what are they paid to? The firstborn. What you talking about, preacher? Boom, the firstborn. What's his name? Jesus. All right, let's keep going. You got the plan. Abraham, let's start with Abraham. He had a calling. We talked about that. And he had a free will. He could have chosen not to listen to the voice of truth when it spoke to him. And look, and he had the circumcision. Abraham had the circumcision. All right, let's go ahead and look at this scripture right here. Exodus 12 and 23. It says, so you understand that Abraham was called before there was a nation called Israel. And you understand that Abraham was here before the law. And you understand that God gave the circumcision to Abraham before there was an Israel and before there was a law. As a matter of fact, about 400 years before then. All right. And so I just want you to just be aware that I just, we're just trying to keep our, our heads straight on chronology so that we can understand the Bible better as we read, right? But this is, now we're fast forwarding to Exodus. So Abraham has already been called by God. Abraham was told by God to circumcise all the males that followed after, right? And as a matter of fact, well, no, let's, yeah, yeah, let's just keep moving for now. All right. And so, but now we're fast forwarding 400 years and we're at the Exodus. And this is what God says, and, and I wanted you to see the circumcision because it's about to become real relevant here in a second. For the Lord will pass through to smite the Egyptians. That word smite means to slay, and it means to bring, wreak havoc, and it means to, to, to pour out his wrath, and it's talking about judgment. And Egypt is a type of the world, and Pharaoh is a type of the enemy. And you and I need to understand that judgment is coming on the earth. People don't like to talk about it in the modern church because it makes people feel weird. Good news, good news. Jesus took your wrath upon him, so therefore we do not have to experience the total wrath of God. But I need you to understand, it don't mean that Christians don't ever have to face some bad stuff. All right, now let's just keep going. You're going to smite the Egyptians. And look, when I see the blood on the lintel and on the two side posts, now, now, now God's got a sign for himself. You take this and you put that on your doorpost. It's a sign for me who you belong to. It took an act of faith child of God, for them to say, okay, Moses, you telling me that's what we got to do? I got to cut this lamb's throat. I got to collect his blood and I got to paint it on the doorpost and the side post of my house. Okay. Now, do you imagine that there might've been some Hebrews that night? That's like, that's the most, that's the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard in my life. That doesn't make any logical sense. Moses is a fool. I was there 40 years ago whenever he killed that Egyptian and buried him in the sand. And I do not believe uh, that, that this is really of the Lord. I ain't putting no blood on my house. That's, no, I just painted the house. I'm not putting blood on the house. Do you think that's a possibility? Okay, because I can tell you that there was also a possibility that some Egyptians overheard what was going on, and they're like, look, I done seen some of what's going on around here. Because, see, you got to understand they've already been through the plagues at this point. 
God's been giving them an opportunity for repentance, but they refuse to listen. And some of them Egyptians, I, I bet you, hey, man, look, I'm going to go get my own lamb. Look, show me how y'all cut that thing. Okay, I'm about to put some blood on the door. I believe that. I can't prove it to you, but I believe that. All right? He said, so now it's a sign for God. All right, who's going to believe my word? Who's going to believe my word and who's going to put my faith into action? And who's going to paint the blood on the doorpost and the side post? Because when I see the blood, he says, I will pass over the door. And I will not suffer the destroyer to come in unto your houses to smite you. I will not smite you. Now, th- look, written, written 4,000 4, years before our time frame, 2,000 years before the New Testament, to understand the typology that's going on here. Come on, church. We got to get, we got to dig deep. I've preached this to y'all so many times, y'all ought to be able to preach it to me, that Egypt as a type of the world, Pharaoh as a type of Satan, God's people caught up under slavery and God delivers them out with the blood of a lamb. Oh, hallelujah. 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 What a beautiful, beautiful plan. Amen. All right. Now let's look a little bit closer at this because look, God's telling Moses, I'm about to smite the Egyptians. He's talking about judgment. And let's think about circumcision for a second because I told you circumcision came before the law. Circumcision came before the you have to be circumcised to be saved today? No. Somebody asked that a long time ago at the old church. No, it doesn't have anything to do with that. Listen, the New Testament, Jesus provided the fulfillment of circumcision. The book of Romans says it's a circumcision of the heart. When you give your life to Christ and you begin to submit yourself under the will of God, guess what happens? The Holy Spirit takes a scalpel and like a fine surgeon, he begins to cut away the flesh because you see, that's what circumcision is. It's flesh that's in the way. It's flesh that's in the way, and it's removed through the shedding of blood. And now in the New Testament, the Holy Spirit, through the shed blood of Jesus Christ, begins to wield the surgeon's scalpel and cuts out and takes out things that are in our life that prevent God from moving in our heart, prevent us from making, uh, producing fruit of the Holy Spirit. Whatever the case, I just want you to see that. All right, so let's go to Exodus 4, 21 through 26. Exodus 4, 21 through 26. You know, Mary, when she gave her testimony, let me build that up for you a little bit so you can see. I know we all getting kind of old. Some of y'all are still young. Don't laugh. Okay, look. So Mary, when she gave her testimony, she made the point that there's a difference between people that are in sin and people that are reprobate, right? And reprobate means you're beyond, you're beyond help. God will turn people over to a reprobate mind. But one of the things she also said was that God does not take pleasure in the death of the wicked. So God is about to smite Egypt. God is about to pronounce judgment on Egypt. He's about to, he's a, this is the last plague that he's about to do. And he, what's he going to do? He's going to kill the firstborn of Egypt. But look, he's going to save the firstborn of Israel. So let's see what God has to say to Moses. And the Lord said unto Moses, when you go to return into Egypt, see that you do all those wonders before Pharaoh, which I have put in your hand. But I will harden his heart, and he shall not let the people go. And thou shalt say unto Pharaoh, thus says the Lord, Israel, look at this, is my son, even my firstborn. I need you to understand this. This is important. The tithe is connected to the firstborn because the tithe is connected to this right here that we're reading about. We're about to break it down. You're going to see it with your own eyeballs. And I say unto thee, let my son go, who Israel, that he may serve me. And if you refuse to let him go, behold, I will slay your son, even your Firstborn. And it came to pass by the way in the end that the Lord met him and sought to kill him. Now, who's that personal pronoun referring to? Who's that him connected to? Who? Moses. What? God going to kill Moses? Yep. We're about to find out why. God just rolled up on the man and said, I'm seeking to kill you, Moses. 
Why would you do such a thing? Look, it's right here. You might not understand it at first, but I'm gonna help break it down. Then Zipporah, that's Moses' wife, took a sharp stone, cut off the foreskin of her son and cast it at his, Moses' feet and said, surely a bloody husband you are to me. So he, Moses, let him go. What does that mean? That means Moses was holding that boy whenever she cut the foreskin off of that boy and threw it at his feet. So now why does God wanna kill Moses? Because God said, I'm about to kill the firstborn of the wicked and I do not delight in the death of evil people. And here you are walking over there about to pronounce judgment on the world, but you yourself and your family still got uncircumcised flesh and you ain't walking in the will of God. Because I gave this to your father Abraham before there ever was a law. And I told you that all the males that are my possession and my portion must be circumcised. And you ain't even circumcised your son, Moses. You've been living with this Midianite woman. And you've been producing offspring. And you expect me to use you to kill the firstborn of Egypt and to save the firstborn of Israel? And you hadn't even circumcised. You're not even walking with me, Moses. So I wanted you to see that. But look, that's one sign that God gave to Israel, the sign of circumcision. It was instituted by Abraham, but it was reinstituted in the law. All right. The second sign is unleavened bread. Let's look at this for a second. Now, unleavened bread, just so that you understand, it was a festival that was correlated with the Passover. The best I can understand it, the Passover was sacrificed the first day and then there was a week of unleavened bread. What is unleavened? What is leaven? Yeast. Thank you, sir. And what does yeast in the Bible represent? Sin. And what do they have to do? Get the leaven out of the house for a whole seven day period. What is this a type of? Cleaning it out, purging it out, purge your heart, get it out of there. Cause look, and you're going to do this because you, why? You belong to me and you're my portion and you're different than the world around you. But let's see what he said. Exodus 13, six through 10. Exodus 13, six through 10. Seven days you shall eat unleavened bread, and in the seventh day shall be a feast to the Lord. Unleavened bread shall be eaten seven days. There shall no leavened bread be seen with thee, neither shall there be leaven seen in all your quarters, meaning in your house. And you shall show your son in that day, saying, look at this, this is done because, why? Of that which the Lord did unto me. Now you say, I just defer, you see how I highlighted me? Can you see it? You might not be able to see it where you're sitting. I highlighted me because that's the first time I ever saw that. God made it personal. They're talking to a group of people. He's saying, you're going to tell this to the whole, to all of your people. But he's saying, you're going to say to your own son, this is what the Lord did for me. See, Jesus did it for you, my friend. He did it for the whole world. But until you understand that he died for your sin, it doesn't become your personal savior, all right? So which the Lord did for me when I came forth out of Egypt, and look at this, it shall be a sign unto thee, okay, upon your hand, like this is gonna be like something you wear like a bracelet, like your, your Apple watch. Boom, what time is it? Oh, got a text message. It's gonna be a sign unto you that every time you see this unleavened bread, every year you're gonna do this unleavened bread, it's gonna be a memorial. It's gonna be a reminder to you between your eyes that the Lord's law may be in your mouth for with a strong hand has the Lord brought you out of Egypt. You shall therefore keep this ordinance in his season from year to year to year. Amen? It didn't, I added this, the third year. The point is, is this, is that God says, I got a people, I got a portion. They belong to me. I'm gonna, this ain't no negotiating. Did you see a negotiation here? I'm, no, I'm looking. I'm not trying to, I mean, I know I'm funny sometimes, but I'm not trying to be. Uh, I don't see whether he says, unleavened bread shall be eaten. There shall be no, okay, you get the point. There, the, uh, neither shall there be, he, he's not saying, like, look, come on. Now, one time in Isaiah, I remember he says, come, sit down, let us reason together. Though your sins be like scarlet, they shall be made white as well. He's, he's asking in that time frame, look, I just want to reason with you. He ain't reasoning right now. He's telling them, you belong to me. I, look, I delivered you. I purchased you through the blood of a lamb. Christian, 
You belong to him. You are his possession. You are his portion. Hey, he is your God. I'm going to say it. He owns you. He is the God of heaven and earth and all that in them is. He is the possessor of heaven. Oh, ain't nobody owns me. Well, you just go right on ahead, brother. You go on ahead, sister, and you let me know how that works out for you in the end. Ain't no man going to be. He ain't man. He's a God. (laughs) He is the God. (laughs) Hallelujah. All right. So here we go. The firstborn. So this is another sign. Passover is a sign. Circumcision is a sign. Unleavened bread is a sign. Look, now we're going to redeem the firstborn. We're going to Exodus 13, 14 through 16. Exodus 13, 14 through 16. You ready? And look, and it shall come, it shall be when your son asks you. All right, let's go back a little bit. Look, and it shall be when the Lord shall bring you into the land of Canaan, of the Canaanites. Y'all understand that before it was called Israel, it was called Canaan. It's the promised land, all right? Before the Lord shall bring you into the land of the Canaanites, as he swore to you and to your fathers, because again, he swore to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. It's a beautiful thing. You ever started a prayer like that? I come to you, uh, you know, the old ancient of days, the father of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Boy, I tell you, I've prayed that a couple times. It's like, woo I can feel it because it's like acknowledging the ancient one of Israel. It's acknowledging your father. Oh, hallelujah, so good. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. But look, he said he swore it that I'm going to give it to you. And you shall set apart unto the Lord all that opens the matrix. That's, that means the womb, the cervix, if you will, the, the first one to come out of the, the uterus, okay? And every firstling that comes out of a beast which you have, the males shall be the Lord's. They belong to God. The firstborn male, the firstborn is connected to the tithes. We're about to make that connection in a second. But I need you to see the judgment was on the firstborn of Egypt. Salvation was on the firstborn of the Lord because God said, Israel is my firstborn. And every firstling of an ass, you shall redeem with a lamb. And if you will not redeem it, then you shall break his neck. Now, look, I, I love this kind of stuff, but it hit me the other day. Look, that, that donkey is unclean. It's not considered a clean animal. God don't want no sacrifice from no unclean animal. Because see, an unclean animal represents you and I in our sin. The lamb represents Jesus without blemish. God, you you can't die for your own sin, my friend. No human being on earth can die for your sin. Jesus, the clean one, had to die in place of those that are unclean. All right? He says, so then you shall break his neck. So in other words, like this is you got a little bit of leeway here. If you have a firstborn donkey and he's a male, and you got a bunch of sheep and you need another work animal, you don't have to. Uh, break the, the unclean animal's neck. I just need one of them sheep. <laughs> Are you going to redeem it with one of them lambs? That's a type of Christ. You see this? This is 2,000 years. You can't make this stuff up. God's writing it in his Old Testament. All right? And he says, and it shall be when your son asks you, because surely, I told you all this before, but surely if you live on the farm, And every time a firstborn male opens up the womb, your daddy goes over there and either breaks the donkey's neck or he offers up the lamb as a sacrifice. You know, I'm thinking like this is happening maybe multiple times in a year. Sooner or later, the kids go, but daddy, that's Charlie. (laughs) I named him. I named him. I I knew he was in his mama's belly and I I wanted to name him Charlie. Why we got to kill him? I'm going to tell you why. You're going to say to him because by strength of the hand of the Lord brought us out from Egypt, from the house of bondage. Amen. And it came to pass when Pharaoh would hardly let us go that the Lord slew all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both the firstborn of man, the firstborn of beast. Therefore, I sacrifice to the Lord all that opens the womb being males, but all the firstborn of my children, I redeem. Now, the way that we redeem the children is, is that there's money that has to be paid. And I wanted to be careful that it didn't overdo the scripture, but you got to understand there's a whole nother level to this where they had to pay a certain amount of money for their own children. But look, it's, and it shall be a token for you. There's another sign, a reminder. And for frontlets for, between your, for your eyes, by strength of the hand, the Lord brought us out of Egypt. Amen. All right. So let's just keep going right here. 
Exodus chapter 23, 11. But the seventh year, this is what you call the Shemitah. You remember when I drew that little thing? Okay, some of y'all are familiar with the Shemitah. Uh, the Shemitah is kind of like a Sabbath. So the Sabbath is, is once a week, and the Shemitah is once every seventh year. So the Sabbath is the seventh day, and the Shemitah is the seventh year. And this is what they were supposed to do in the seventh year. In the seventh year, you shall let it rest and lie still. I'm talking about the land, okay? Because guess whose land it is? <laughs> guess whose house it is? Guess whose car it is? Guess whose breath it is in your lungs? Guess who, guess who it is? It, it don't belong to you, my friend. No, not, not if you're his possession. No, I mean, you're, you, we got to make a determination in our hearts and in our lives. Who do we belong to? Because if we belong to the Lord, we belong to the Lord, all right? And this is what he said. If you're my possession, this is what I'm telling you I want you to do. This requires faith. Now, he's not asking you and I to do this anymore, specifically, but it's a type of a tithe. It's a type of trusting God. Okay, and so he says, you will let the land re lie, rest and lie still that the poor of your people may eat and what they leave the beasts of the field shall eat. In like manner, you shall deal with your, your vineyard and with your olive yard. Look, he's saying with everything that you have in this seventh year, you need to let the land rest. It belongs to me and I'm telling you, I want a Sabbath. It's a type of, of being able to trust God. Now, what he told him was, I don't want you to plow it. I don't want you to sow it. I don't want you to harvest it. Whatever it produces, you can eat from it. It'll sustain you. But basically what he's saying is you ain't conducting no business this year by selling agriculture. You don't trust me. I'm going to feed you. I'm going to take care of you. Now, if you're anything like me, if we're not careful and we just don't know any better, we're thinking... Chick-fil-A, come on, man. And I'm not even saying that Chick-fil-A had to do that. That's something that the Lord put on Chick-fil-A's heart, whatever that man's name is. He chooses to close on Sunday. Do you think he's hurting for money? I'm not trying to say he got blessed because he chose to close on Sunday because McDonald's got him beat probably. Okay, but I don't know who McDonald's is serving, but that's another story for another time. I'm just trying to make a point. If Chick-fil-A can be blessed like that, you don't think that God can bless the other six years? to oversupply the seventh year? You don't think that if you give whatever the Lord's showing you based upon his word to give, that he can't overabundantly bless the rest? I gotta tell you something, my friend. Look, money is a hard thing to come off of. <laughs> Can I get an amen? <laughs> come on. Can I get an amen? Come on, brothers and sisters. Don't, don't go to sleep on me. Don't, don't, and look, don't let that lying devil start to turn your heart against me because I'm just reading you the word of God. It's hard to come off that money. The other day, Yvette, <laughs> Yvette was telling me some stuff. I'm not going to get into all the details that had to do with her job. I'm like, oh, no, nah, you're going to be good. She said, get that paper. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, while we, got to get, while we got time to get the paper, go ahead and get the paper. But don't let it be your Lord. Don't let it be your God. Amen? No, don't let it rule you. Don't let it enslave you. How many times have I said it? The problem is not the 10% that I give to God. The problem is my 90% he lets me keep. I ain't doing it right. Lord, help me. Help me to learn from you. All right, so you get the point. And look, I wanted you to see this too. Look, the Sabbath. So these, are, these don't have to do with the part of the tithe I'm showing. This has to do with that little circle I drew for you to remind you of reminders and signs. The Sabbath was one of those things. Now, I'm going to show The Chosen, the first two episodes of The Chosen Friday night. Everybody's invited. Bring friends. We're going to order some stuff and whatnot. I mean, once we know how many people are here, we'll order some pizza or something like that. But look, I, I'm going to explain more about The Chosen. I won't take time up for this later some, if I have any concerns. But what I'm getting out of it more than anything is how he is preparing a context. Okay, and I need to go back and do some more research on this. But there's one episode in the movie where in the show where they show four to five different houses celebrating a Sabbath meal. Dude, there's places in this series where, well, there's a place where Jesus is ministering with, or, play, or mess, you know, uh, fellowshipping with some children. And then in the midst of it, and look, do, do you love children? I don't know if you love children, but I know Jesus loves children. I know I love children. And he's just like treating them. He's giving them little things to do and they're playing and he's doing his work. And then all of a sudden, do y'all know the, and I don't even know what it is. He said, do y'all know the da, 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 da? And they're like, yeah. He said, well, let's hear it. And they just start quoting scripture. Now, the thing that I know about the Jewish people is that's legit. 
David would have learned the word of God back when he was yay high to a grasshopper. He was out there in the field strumming his harp, you know, writing psalms to the Lord. Quote, they, these people quoting scripture because they knew who they belonged to. And they hid your word. I have hidden your word in my heart that I not sin against thee. But to see it played out on the screen like that, it's like, wow. These people, these are the signs and the reminders that God gave to his people because he knew that when he sent them into a land filled with the heathen, they were going to be tempted to be moved away from him and moved into the world. So they had constant reminders before them who they belonged to, right? So every Sabbath, you're not going to work on the Sabbath. That's once a week, my friend. You're not going to work on the Sabbath. I'm not telling you don't work on the, Sabbath, on the Sunday, on the seventh day. That's not what I'm telling you. Why? Because Jesus fulfilled the Sabbath. Aren't you glad that I think about these things or the Holy Spirit helps me think about these things so that you don't leave out of here like, what does this crazy preacher want me to do? My boss says I have to. I know like, you know, good to see you over there, brother. Some people are boat captains. What? No, you're going to get me a helicopter ride, sir, and you're going to fly me off of this mug because guess what? My pastor said I can't work on Sunday. No, that's not what I'm saying. If you read Hebrews chapter 3, it's very explicit. The book of Hebrews explains that Jesus is the Sabbath. He's our rest. Amen. Hallelujah. All right. But for Israel, you're going to keep this because you're my possession. You're my portion. I'm your God. And you're going to do what I ask you to do. He says, speak unto the children of Israel, saying, verily, my Sabbath you shall keep, for it is a sign between you, between me and you throughout your generations, that you may know that I am the Lord that sanctifies you. Hallelujah. What does he mean by I am the Lord that sanctifies you? What does sanctify mean? Separate? It means to be made holy, but, it, but the main idea is in Christ, we're separated out and made holy in Christ. So he's pulling us out of the world. So what he's saying is the Sabbath is one of the ways I'm going to separate you from the world around you. Ain't nobody else doing this stuff, my friend. As a matter of fact, uh, there it goes, sanctify you. As a matter of fact, I left this blank so I could draw on it a little bit. Look, so, so far what we got is we got the Sabbath. We got the Sabbath. Right, we got the circumcision. We got the firstborn. What else we got? We got the Passover. We got unleavened bread. And what did I say? I just, I'm just trying to say like what I'm seeing here is that these are signs and reminders of who these people belong to. So who else is doing this? Who else on the face of the earth is every one day, every week, you don't work and you focus on the Lord and you remember his goodness for your life. Are the Amalekites doing this? Are the Perizzites or the, or the Jebusites? No, they ain't doing this. The circumcision, is everybody else on the face of the earth cutting off their foreskin? No. Who does that? These people. The firstborn. Oh, you got a firstborn donkey? Okay, breaking its neck. Can you imagine one of them? They wouldn't have probably hung out with them, but I'm just saying one of them Amalekite boys coming over to the house. What in the world is your daddy doing breaking that donkey's neck? Why didn't he just give that to my daddy? Oh, no, that's not what we do around here, my friend. We, we break the firstborn's neck or else we offer up a sheep. Who in the world? Who's doing this? These people. Once a year on Passover, they kill a lamb. They eat this bread they eat these bitter herbs. They do all of this stuff. Once a year, every year, for seven days, they take all the yeast out the house. Who does this? Stuff? Listen, think about this. Once a week, I got a reminder that I belong to God. Okay. Once, maybe four, I don't know, depending on how big your herd is, what maybe could be two, month, two times a month, could be just two times a year. A firstborn male is born. And I'm offering up a sacrifice. So I already got a Sabbath. So once a week, I'm being reminded of who I belong to. Possibly two times a month, I'm being reminded of who I belong to. Once a year at Passover and unleavened bread, I'm being reminded of who I belong to. I'm not trying to be crude. I promise I'm just stating the facts. About five to six times a day, a Jewish man knew who he belonged to. As he urinated, he knew who he belonged to. 
Yet even still, these people seem to forget who they belong to. And I say that with all love and compassion because if you think that I had never been in seasons of my life where I seem to have had a brain fog and forgot who I was called to serve. Come on, somebody, help me out. All right, here we go. Numbers 3, 44 through 45. And the Lord spoke unto Moses saying, take the Levites instead of all the firstborn among the children of Israel. So now we're getting into this tithe thing. Let us not forget what the firstborn represents in the very beginning. If you do not let my people go to worship me, I'm gonna smite your firstborn, Pharaoh. But I'm gonna save my firstborn. So every year for Passover and unleavened bread, every time they break a donkey's neck and their kid asks, dad, why do we do this? Because our God delivered us out of Egypt with a mighty hand. Repeatedly throughout the whole Old Testament, you will see even in, I mean, I meant to look it up so I don't wanna just throw stuff out there, but I'm pretty sure Isaiah talks about it. Jeremiah talks about it. They're constantly reminding that God delivered the nation out of Egypt. Listen, God delivered you out of the world. God delivered me out of the world. Satan used to have us bound up, but he don't have it. He shouldn't have us bound up. Lord set us free because we ain't supposed to be bound up. Oh, we, sometimes we like, the, we like the Israelites and we want to go back to the world. Help us, Lord. Them melons and them leeks and them garlics and them onions ain't that good. Help us, Lord. All right. So for the firstborn, you're going to take the Levites instead of all the firstborn among the children of Israel. But wouldn't that be a mess? Uh, Mr. Schneiderman, we heard that you just had a, your firstborn male. Congratulations, but we'll be taking him now. God said, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to do that. I'm going to keep all the Levites. Now, if you'll remember who is a Levite, that the, the first Levi, this is, we're going to add a little Sunday school in here. The first Levi was the third son of Jacob and Leah. But now hundreds of years have passed. And so there's multiple little Levites running around. They come, they're part of that tribe. And they got little clans inside the tribe and they got little families within the clans and they all know that they come from the tribe of Levi. Our great, 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 great grandpa, his name was Levi. Okay, and so he says, I'm gonna take all them Levites and they're gonna be my portion to represent the firstborn. And y'all all my firstborn. I call, I told Pharaoh y'all were my firstborn, but I'm just gonna go ahead and take the, the Levites for myself. They're my portion. They represent my portion. And the cattle of the Levites, instead of their cattle and the Levites, shall be mine. I am the Lord. All right. Look at this. And I, behold, have taken the Levites from among the children of Israel instead of all the firstborn that opened the womb among the children of Israel. Therefore, the Levites shall be mine. And I, behold, have taken your brethren, the Levites, from among the children of Israel. To you they are given as a gift for the Lord. Now look at this. What are they, what are they called to do, God? to do the service of the tabernacle of the congregation, to do the work of the ministry. Now, it's been many years I've been studying these kinds of concepts, but do you understand what the ministry of the tabernacle, there was a lot involved in the ministry of the tabernacle, but let's just understand real quick. I didn't even plan on talking to this. I'm gonna make it fast. They had a, they had a, 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 a brazen altar. And every day at 9 a.m. and 3 p.m., a whole burnt offering had to be offered on that brazen altar. And then there was behind that a bronze laver where they had to wash. They talk, look, there's a scripture that says that the women, that the bronze laver was made, now Old King James Version says, with the looking glasses of the women. They didn't have no glass back then, but what they had was shiny metal. Make it with the looking glasses of the metal. And look at this, I never thought of this before. Well, I mean, I thought of this a long time ago. I might've even heard it from Brad Bullock. You got the Bible says, give honor where I was due. Well, yeah, brother Brad. Anyway, look. When they went down there, when the priest would offer up the sacrifice and he's got blood all over his hands and possibly blood on his face because he cut that carotid artery when he went to bleed him and it sprinkled up on his face when he leaned over there to wash himself, what did he see in the looking glasses at the bottom? The blood. Oh, come on, somebody. You can't get no better than that. You see the blood. Why the blood? Because it requires the shedding of blood to remit the wages of sin. 
Hallelujah. So you got, you got a bronze altar that represents the whole burnt offering that has to be offered. That's a type of Jesus. The altar is a type of Jesus. The sacrifice is a type of Jesus. The bronze laver is a type of the word that tells you to be remembered about Jesus. And then when you walk on the inside, you got, you got over here to the left, the menorah, which is the light that lit the area so the priest even knew what he was doing. Jesus is the light of the world. He transferred his light unto us. Now you are the light of the world. Hallelujah. And in the middle was an altar of incense. Jesus Jesus is our interceder. He is our go-between. And hallelujah, we can also intercede for those around us. And look, the table of showbread, who is the bread that came from heaven? And then the veil. He's the veil. The word of God says that through the veil, which is his flesh, you have access into the grace of God. And beyond the veil, there was an ark. And on the ark, there was a mercy seat. Hallelujah. And once a year on the mercy seat, blood was sprinkled on the mercy seat. Turning the place from judgment to mercy. What was on the inside? The law. Was the law kept or broken? It was broken. The cherubim, two angels spread out, looking on the mercy seat, peering deep down into the broken law. Now once a year, it's covered with blood. Now they they see is the blood. See, in Christ, God doesn't see your broken law. Don't let nobody keep telling you who you used to be, child of God, because you ain't him no more. And don't you, please, let me be sweet. Don't you run around this place right here talking about people in here and their past. Past is yesterday. We can't change it. Today is the present, and we're moving forward in the ways of the Lord. Please don't bring up my past because that's, that's the voice of the devil. <laughs> He's the accuser of the brethren. Pray for me if you think something's wrong with me today, and maybe tomorrow it'll be better. Amen? Thank you, Jesus. All right. So they do the service of the tabernacle. Now you see all this service going on? Now what do all of those things represent? Jesus. And what do they represent? Jesus and his work. All the, now, now we're talking about the tithe. All the best of the oil, all the best of the wine, of the grain, the first fruits of what they give to the Lord, I give to you. He's talking about all the tribes are going to give their best stuff, and whenever they give it to me, I'm going to give it to you. The first ripe fruits of all that is in their land, which they bring to the Lord, shall be yours. Everyone who is clean in your house may eat it. God had provision for the priests, which came from Levi, but he also had provision for the Levites. And the provision came from the people. And the people gave unto the Lord, and the Lord allowed the Levites to have it. Firstborn was judged in Egypt. Firstborn was saved in Israel. Firstborn is Israel. Firstborn is Levi. Levi does the work of God and takes care of the house of God. The tithe is paid to Levi. The tithe supports the work of the firstborn. You getting this? It's pretty clear. Matthew 125. And knew her not till she had brought forth the firstborn son, and he called his name Jesus. See, I got you to understand. You need to understand something. Thus far, I have not, and listen, I'm, t- I'm not saying this about me. When the time is right, I'll know it. I have thus far not taken a check from this church in eight, I think it's eight years. How many years is it now? This Christmas? It's either seven or eight. I haven't taken it. Now, the church has helped me get to Mexico on two occasions. I have every right to take a check from this church. I work hard, but I'm not trying to make you feel weird. I'm just trying to make a point. I'm not asking you to pay a tithe so that I can get a little something, something in my pocket. This ain't got nothing to do with that. Amen. Uh, You know, and, and what I do is I pay my tithe to the church. Oh, well, yeah, that's because it's your church. I was paying my tithe, my full tithe to Crossing Place. I was paying my full tithe to Cornerstone. I was even paying my tithe whenever I was going to Twin City Gospel, just a new little Christian, and I, I didn't like it. <laughs> now, hold on a second. Let me tell you the truth. When I was a little new Christian at Twin City Gospel Temple, I did not like paying my tithe. I, I, I just do not even paid my tithe. I was so aggravated about it. I kept talking to Don, yeah, man, you people crazy. What y'all talking about? I've been working in that pipe yard, spraying vice, Varsol, working in the heat of the sun, man, cleaning pipe. Oh, no. But, but I did it and just, ah. 
Now I'm so happy because I look backwards and I'm like, oh, Lord, okay, how are you going to outpay God? How are you going to outgive God? How you, I belong to you, Lord. What do you want me to do? What, what do you want me to do? You purchased me with your blood. Yeah. Just pray about this, church. Amen? Just pray about it. Let the Lord lead you. That's all I'm saying. All right. Firstborn is Jesus. Amen? Look at this. Luke 2, 23. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every firstborn male that opens the womb shall be called holy to the Lord. We're talking about the birth of Jesus right here. I'm making a point. And to offer a sacrifice according to what was said in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. There you go. He's the firstborn. Jesus is the ultimate fulfillment of the firstborn. Praise God. He's so good. The tithe supports the work of the firstborn, does it not? Because the firstborn is Levi, because God took Levi out of Israel and they're doing the work of the tabernacle. The tithe supports the work of the firstborn. Who is the firstborn that ministers to this tabernacle? Who's the firstborn that ministers to this? Ta Are you a tabernacle of God? Well, let's just go ahead and slow down a second. Let's think about this tabernacle in this wilderness. Huh? A pillar of cloud by day, I will give you. A pillar of fire by night, I will give you. When you see it move, you get up and you move. So we got a wandering people called Israel, our older brother, the people of God. And when God says, when the Lord gets ready, you got to move, you got to move, you got to move. So you got to get up and move. And what are they carrying? They're carrying the articles. The Levites are the ones that are, that are carrying some of the articles and the high priests are carrying the real ministry stuff. Okay, and, and what is, when they set it all up, what happens beyond that veil? Yeah, I told you the ark, the mercy seat, the blood, but what did God say about that mercy seat? Exodus 25 and 8, he said this, build me a sanctuary, build me a tabernacle. Why? Why do you want us to build you a tent, God? So that my presence can dwell with my people. Where's your presence going to dwell, Lord? I can't, he comes into the holy of holies, beyond the veil. And there I will meet with you on the mercy seat where the blood has been sprinkled. See, when the blood of Jesus is applied to this heart right here, the Holy Spirit moves in. The presence of God moves in. And now you and I become a walking tabernacle upon this earth. Listen to me. It don't get no better than that. Look, in the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. The Word became flesh and dwelled amongst us. If you look it up in the Greek, the Word dwelled, what does it mean? He tabernacled with us. Us. The Spirit of God was not indwelling humanity. Jesus shows up with the Spirit of God in him. He dies on the cross. He said, is it expedient that I go away? For if I do not go, he will not come. And when he comes, you know him for he has been with you, but he will be in you. And now, my friend, you are the tabernacle of God. Everywhere you go, you bring the presence of God with you. So who is the firstborn that ministers to this tabernacle? His name is Jesus. His name is Jesus. Jesus. Does he deserve our tithe? 